Good morning, this is Chris and Brian reading the Society News for Friday the 15th of June 2018. On Tuesday, Laura will be attending the Our Place drop-in session which is held at West White Sports and Community Centre in Moa Place Freshwater between 10am and 12.30pm on Tuesday the 19th of June. She will have information about the society, the clubs and activities available, as well as demonstrations of some low vision aids available. Come along and say hello and enjoy a free cup of tea or coffee. The dolphins are swimming this Tuesday the 19th of June in ride at the waterside pool. The pool is closed to the public whilst the group swims. There are male and female volunteers to help you get in and out of the pool, as well as lifeguards to ensure your safety. To join the dolphins, please call the Society first to notify us of your swimming ability. Wednesday. The weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House this Wednesday, 20th of June from 10.30am. The coffee mornings are not just for blind and partially sighted people, Anybody can come along and have a cup of coffee or tea as well as a piece of cake. We will also be holding the low vision drop-in between 10am and 12 noon on Wednesday the 20th of June. This is a weekly event that allows you to view and try the low vision equipment we have at the Society without the need for an appointment. The Wednesday Social Group will be meeting Wednesday 20th of June at 2pm in Millbrook House. The entertainment this week is a talk about Yarmouth Pier. The group lasts approximately 45 minutes, which is then followed by tea or coffee and cake. Thursday. The Thursday Social Group are meeting on Thursday the 21st of June at Millbrook House. The group meets from 10.30am till 2pm. You can knit or just have a chat and then later in the afternoon volunteers come in and read to the group from different topics. Any other news? The Site for White office opening times will be changing from Monday 18th of June. The office will be staffed Monday to Thursday, 9am till 4.30pm and Friday, 9am till 4pm. The popular BBC Two quiz show Eggheads is looking for contestants. They are looking for teams of six with the quizzing know-how to take on the resident general knowledge geniuses. If you think you've got what it takes and would like to challenge the eggheads, then you can email eggheads at 12yard.com or write to Eggheads Application 12 Yard Productions, The Hub G7, 70 Pacific Key, Glasgow, G511DZ. The closing date is midnight on the 22nd of June 2018. Local volunteers from the Guide Dogs charity will be visiting a number of venues over the next few months, talking about the work of the charity and how you can be involved. They will be at Sandown Library on the 23rd of June, Ride Library on the 21st of July, and Ventnor Library on the 18th of August. All the library venue times will be 10.30am till 2.30pm. You can also find them at the Isle of Wight Community Club Open Day at Park Road in Cowes on August 27th from 12 noon onwards. Do you enjoy the activities and facilities provided by Sight for White? Perhaps you recently attended an activity or event and would like to wax lyrical about it. If so, then Chris Kane would like to hear from you. As part of our promoting well-being and supporting services and activities, we would like to hear your positive feedback 
which will be part of a video, video promoting Sight for White. If you have a story you would like to enthuse about and don't mind being recorded on video, then please contact Chris Kane on 522 205 or email admin at iwsb.org.uk. Scaffolding news. The following is a list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding or hoarding. We are, are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week by week basis. Also included are tables and chairs permits that have been issued in the past week. Bay and Ventnor area. There is currently scaffolding at Premier Inn 1 to 9 Esplanade Sandown. 11A and 11B St John's Road Sandown 79 High Street Sandown The Toymaster 103 High Street Sandown Scaffold up in Albion Road 40 Little Stairs Road Shanklin Shanklin Hotel East Mount Road Shanklin United Reformed Church High Street Shanklin 39 Atherley Road, Shanklin. Bar 64 High Street, Shanklin. Corner of Trinity Road and Madeira Road, Ventnor 1 Boniface Road and into Trinity Road, Ventnor. Hose Road, Dixon 1 High Street, Ventnor. Lewis Cottage, Market Street, Ventnor. 21 West Street, Ventnor. There are currently hoardings at White City Culver Parade Sandown, Premier Inn 1 to 9 Esplanade Sandown, United Reform Church High Street Shanklin. There are currently skips at 64 Steep Hill Road Shanklin, 26 South Street Ventnor, 25 Leeson Road Ventnor, 62 Newport Road God's Hill. New scaffolding is due at 2 Eleanor House, Grove Road, Ventnor, from the 26th of June. Cows area. There is currently scaffolding at Royal London Yacht Club, the Parade Cows, Sainsbury's 129 to 130 High Street Cows, 93 High Street Cows, behind hoarding, 3 Castle Road Cows, 78 Park Road Cows and there is currently hoardings at 93 High Street Cows. There are currently skips at 42 St Andrews Street Cows, 22 St David's Road East Cows. New scaffolding is due at 91 High Street Cows from the 25th of June. And new skips are due at number 4, Trafalgar Court, Terminus Road, Cows, from the 22nd of June. Newport area. There is currently scaffolding at 18 Lugley Street, Newport, Domino's, St James Street, Newport, WH Smith, 55 to 56 High Street, Newport, Therapy, 2 to 8 Carisbrook Road, Newport, White Mountain Bike Shop, St James Street, Newport, scaffold up on Orchard Street. 34 Clifford Street, Newport. 2 Avondale Road, Newport. Farnsworth News Agent, 76 St James Street, Newport. Visual Impact, Holyrood Street, Newport. New scaffolding is due at 33 to 34 High Street, Newport from the 2nd of July. Ride area. There is currently scaffolding at Clinton Cards, High Street Ride, WH Smith, 20 to 21 High Street Ride, 26 George Street Ride, The Colonnade, Lynn Street Ride, 13 Cross Street Ride, Charcoal Grill, 65A Union Street Ride, Kids and Co., 
22 High Street ride and the scaffolding is also on Anglesey Street. Bakehouse, Stain Road, Seaview. And there are currently skips at 11 Glendale Close, Wootton. Sand Cove, Pier Road, Seaview. Rock Cliff, Circular Road, Seaview. West White area. There is currently scaffolding at Memorial Hall, Avenue Road, Freshwater, Joe Joe's, School Green Road, Freshwater, Holdings and Post Office, Key Street, Yarmouth, awaiting notification of scaffold being removed. There are currently skips at 8 St Michael's Close, Shellfleet. This week's In Touch. In Touch in this week's episode, Disabled Student Allowance. We hear from a student who has had to appeal twice against his disabled student allowance settlement from the student loans company. The award is supposed to help students with a disability pay for human help and equipment. But Sam Hoskin says his experience has shown that unless they are prepared to argue with your award, blind students could be missing out. The system changed in 2014 to place more emphasis on what universities should be required to provide under equality legislation. Studying philosophy, politics and economics at Jesus College, Oxford, Sam argues that universities with less financial power are unable to provide a safety net if students don't appeal against assessments they feel are wrong. Sam argued that uh, because his course required so many diagrams, he was entitled to a human helper to make those diagrams tactile. His assessment, however, offered no hours of support. His two successful appeals saw that the number rise to 250 hours across the year. Sam argues it's a process which could put prospective blind students off. We also hear from the RNIB's Helen Lee on the new report from the all-party parliamentary group on eye health, which suggests patients are losing sight because of poor provision of eye care. This is presented by Peter White and produced by Kevin Corr. In the Isle of Wight County Press, Friday 15th of June 2018. Colleagues with a heart. Laura Summers did not even have the chance to tell her colleague she was unwell before she collapsed without a pulse. The 32-year-old cover supervisor at Sandown Bay Academy was doing her usual rounds of the school field when she suffered a sudden and unexpected cardiac arrest. Were it not for the quick reaction of colleagues, access to a nearby defibrillator and the fast response from the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service, it is likely Laura would have died. There were so many chances for me not to have made it, said Laura. If my colleagues hadn't acted so quickly and St Mary's staff weren't so amazing, I would have left two kids, Seb 9 and Leo 7, and a husband, Adam, behind. Hospital staff told Laura that at the time of the incident she had a 2% chance of survival. Laura of Lake was a happy, fit and healthy mum who had taken an exam and worked at the school that day. The doctors still have no idea why or how this happened to me. I had a little bit of a cold, nothing out of the ordinary, before my heart just stopped, she said. Staff at Sandown Bay started emergency CPR, rang 999, and used the school defibrillator to shock Laura twice. Because Laura's heart had stopped for nearly three minutes, which deprived her body and brain of oxygen, once at St Mary's, 
She was placed in an induced coma for nearly three days. It's very bizarre to hear about it all now. It's almost like it happened to someone else, she said. I am in absolute awe of what my colleagues did for me. You don't realise what a strong community you are part of until you experience something like this. Staff were in the road clearing the way for the ambulance. My colleague Andy Gibson gave me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation despite the vomit all over me and Tracy Ann Mitchell worked tirelessly giving me CPR. Laura was transferred to Queen Alexandra Hospital Portsmouth to have a pacemaker fitted and is now awaiting an MRI and a genealogy study. To her delight, she was out of hospital eight days after her cardiac arrest, just in time for her elder child's ninth birthday. Laura said colleagues continued to be incredible throughout her recovery. Laura said, the school is giving me as much time off as I need and staff have come and picked me up for meetings and have taken me out on the weekend. Louise Walker, head of ambulance training and community response services, said Laura was a prime example of how this could happen to anyone and why access to defibrillators was so important. This is why it is so frustrating when they get damaged or stolen. It's taking access to life-saving equipment from communities. Laura added, I'll need another operation every five to seven years to change the battery and I'm on beta blockers. But the benefit of still being here with my family and friends outweighs that overwhelmingly. What is future for Isle of Wight Health Services? Healthcare bosses were quizzed this week about the future of services on the Isle of Wight. The sometimes heated debate, organised by the County Press and Isle of Wight Radio, took place at Cowes Enterprise College, where a panel of representatives from the Isle of Wight National Health Trust and Clinical Commissioning Group, CCG, were questioned about the impact of the Acute Services Redesign, ASR. The ASR will see 11% of specialist hospital services transferred to the mainland. However, Chair of the NHS Trust, Vaughan Thomas, said this would mean 500 fewer journeys to the mainland for islanders each year. The panel said they would not be cutting services in their entirety. Mr Thomas said, We are moving the most critical services that a lot of people don't use. This potentially includes cancer surgeries. He added, more pre-surgery and follow-up appointments would take place on the island. He said, we want people to be off the island for the minimal amount of time necessary. Clinical lead for the redesign, Dr Steve Parker, said, Moving more specialised services would help preserve staff skills. He said, In some circumstances, staff are only undertaking these specialised services between 10 and 20 times a year. If I only undertook 10 of a certain surgery a year, people would start to ask questions about my skills. Services expected to move includes treatment for very premature babies, stroke patients, bowel and colon surgery. The panel said there would be no reduction in the critical care unit. However, no formal decisions have been made ahead of a public consultation. Waiting times for island patients were also discussed. Last week it was revealed that more than 20% of cancer patients were not being treated within two months of their urgent GP referral. 
Dr Parker said part of the problem was the Trust's struggle to recruit and retain staff. He said, for whatever reason, people don't want to come to work on the island. Questions were also raised about transport on and off the island. Dr Parker said, we have to acknowledge there are times in the year when the fog comes down or the weather is bad and we have to be able to tackle it alone. Yes, if we had a bridge or a tunnel, our services would probably be very different, but it's unlikely a bridge will happen in the lifetime of this project or the lifetime of many people on this panel. With the Isle of Wight Festival just a week away, the panel were asked about the potential response to a major incident on the island, given the Trust only has access to one helicopter. <coughs> Dr Parker said, We have limited resilience to deal with major incidents, but that underlies why we need good connections with mainland hospitals. It would overwhelm us very quickly and other agencies would have to step in and respond. The panel said mainland hospitals had been fully supportive of this partnership. Hampshire and Isle of Wight sustainability and transformation lead Richard Samuel said their chief executives will do what they need to do to ensure people of the Isle of Wight have the same standard of care as elsewhere. Isle of Wight MP calls Trump an utter moron. Ireland MP Bob Seeley has tweeted out against the President of the US, Donald Trump. In what Mr Seeley has branded a tongue-in-cheek tweet, the MP said, Sorry, but Trump is an utter moron. I know we shouldn't say that, and we should all be nice to him, etc, etc. But for heaven's sake, there are limits. Not a fan of narcissists. Mr Seeley's reaction comes after Donald Trump fired off a string of an angry tweets criticising his closest allies hours after leaving a divisive G7 summit early. Trump rescinded his signature from the joint communique that leaders from Canada, the UK, France, Germany, Italy and Japan had signed following remarks from Canadian President Trudeau. Tensions are already high between the countries due to the imposing of US tariffs on aluminium and steel. Mr Seeley said it was a joking tweet. I do think he is a bad role, role model, but I find it hard to hold my tongue when he is being moronic. There's an argument to say MPs should be respectful, but it's hard when I don't think he deserves that. The MP's parliamentary assistant, Oscar Bickett, suggested Mr Seeley deleted the tweet, but the MP said he did not always have to listen to him. I'm holding firm for the moment, he said. Boy cut by hidden glass on beach. Sharp glass beneath the sand at Apley Beach led to a horrific five-inch laceration to an 11-year-old boy's knee. Holiday maker Jack Brown suffered such a severe injury he was taken by ambulance to St Mary's Hospital where he had several internal and external stitches and an overnight stay. His father, Simon, told the county press he wanted others to know the danger as the beach is located near to where the sharp glass had been deliberately buried, as reported in the county press on June the 1st. People told us about the glass that had been deliberately buried at Apley Park. I cannot say what caused the injury to Jack, but I want to raise awareness to be careful on what looked like a pristine beach, he said. You would not expect this to happen to a child enjoying playing barefoot football in the sand. To suffer that sort of injury was very traumatic. We were only just thinking how lovely the beach looked that day. The family of Camberley, Surrey, have a holiday home in Ryde. 
And following on from that article, access questions. A review of access issues across the island will be carried out by the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service after it did not have the keys to unlock barriers at Apley. During the call-out to 11-year-old Jack Brown, the ambulance team carried out the rescue along the sand after failing to access the esplanade. County press reader Connor Dyer of Carisbrook said they couldn't reach the immediate scene of the accident because a pair of bollards preventing their access. The services had to go at least 200 metres along the beach, back and forth twice, just to reach the injured child and get him to the ambulance. This delay in the case of a more serious injury would, in my opinion, be very costly to the help of any patient who is stuck on the beach away from the main road. An Isle of Wight council spokesman said enough keys had been provided to the ambulance service for each vehicle. The ambulance service declined to explain why there was not a key in the vehicle. It stated... On arrival, the ambulance crew did not have a key to open the barrier, so a risk assessment was undertaken and the decision was made to carry any necessary equipment along the path. At no time did the actions of the ambulance service have any detrimental impact to the condition of the patient. The ambulance service always risk assess an area to identify the safest route to the scene. For example, taking into consideration the width of the path and how busy the area is with pedestrians. This may mean access via the barrier, such as the one at Apley, is not always the best route. However, the service will be taking steps to ensure keys are in circulation and accessible to all crews should they need them. New Home for Tigers Five tigers who have spent years being forced to perform in a Spanish travelling circus will soon be making their way to the Isle of Wight Zoo to find sanctuary and expert care. The three female and two male tigers, Natasha, Zoppa, Anatella, Girona and Mondo, were given up by the circus amid the growing public backlash around performing animals. They were taken in by Spain's AAP Foundation, which quarantines and rehabilitates circus animals. But, as space and resources are required for ongoing rescue efforts, the Isle of Wight Zoo has stepped in to provide a home. As part of the Wild Heart Trust, the zoo provides the accommodation and care element of the charity's work with big cats and exotic animals, supporting rescue projects and raising awareness of the plight of animals who become victims of the circus and pet trade. Trust founder Charlotte Corney said, The conditions endured by circus animals can be horrific. Things you can't believe are still happening in this so-called enlightened age and, while we continue to campaign and pursue an end to such cruelty, we know the animals we rescue will have a happy retirement. Charlotte and her partner, wildlife TV presenter Chris Packham, recently visited the tigers in Spain to make plans for their journey to the zoo later this month. Meanwhile, the team on the island are busy constructing new facilities to enable the zoo to accommodate the new tigers as well as mounting a major fundraising campaign to support this and future rescue work. Anyone concerned about the plight of circus animals and wishing to help can donate at www.justgiving.com backslash wildheart dash foundation church clock set to ring out again work is underway this month to refurbish the town clock and the clock tower which forms part of shanklin united reformed church 
Extensive work is taking place to restore the cast iron clock face frames and replace the perspect infills with new acrylic. New electrical drivers will control the existing bevel gears for the clock and the strike for the hourly bell. After the rebuilding of the clock tower in 1953, following damage caused by several bombs which fell nearby during 1945, the present clock mechanism was installed by Smith of Derby. The cast iron clock face frames were part of the building which opened in 1883. Back then, the townsfolk wanted a town clock and raised the money for this. The clock and bell came from St Paul's Church in Hammersmith when a new church was built there. The clock has been maintained by the Isle of Wight Council and its predecessors, but it has been still for four years with no funds available to address this problem. Shanklin Town Council has stepped in to support the refurbishment of the town clock, which has enabled the whole project to go ahead. The church is responsible for the fabric of the tower and major stonework repairs are being carried out along with a new roof on the tower and some internal repairs to the concrete. Wessex Synod of the URC has provided a grant to add to the generous gifts made by church members. A celebration will be held on Friday, August the 3rd at 7pm at the church when Councillor Richard Priest will be showing the latest of three DVDs about the history of the town. £3 million upgrade for fire stations. Ireland fire stations are to get £3 million upgrades under plans for a combined Hampshire authority. Islanders would also face a £3 council tax rise under the plans, due to be approved by the Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet last night, Thursday. The island's 11 stations will be brought into line with mainland standards if the proposals to merge operations between Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service and the Isle of Wight Force get the go-ahead. Fire bosses say the old and poor state of the stations would require £3 million worth of work over the next three to five years, with £1.6 million urgently needed in the next two. Improvements will include modernising the bases. Hampshire Civic Chiefs agreed to push forward with a 12-week public consultation. Speaking at a meeting of the Hampshire Fire and Rescue Authority in Winchester, Councillor Christopher Carter said he had spoken to Isle of Wight Council leader Councillor Dave Stewart who confirmed the authority would back the proposals. Currently, the mainland service is made up of crews from Hampshire, Southampton and Portsmouth. But taking over the island's fire service would cost the combined authority an extra £460,000 a year to properly maintain this service. Around £200,000 Pounds of this will be funded by a Band D tax increase of £3.74 per year, which will only be billed to islanders in 2019-20. Rob Carr, Chief Financial Officer of Hampshire County Council, said this brought the island's precept charge in line with Hampshire's, which is £65.74. pence. Chief Fire Officer Neil Odin said he was confident combining the services would be good for the authority. We have already gained a great deal of insight from the way the Isle of Wight fire officers deal with things, he said. On the mainland we have a lot of support from all around us, but the island force has learnt to be self-sufficient. Currently, Hampshire fire officers are only deployed to the island in an emergency, but under the new plans this would be changed, allowing them to help in less critical circumstances. The island's 11 fire stations and the land they are on could be owned by Hampshire under the new plans. 
Music guru Ian wins Oxfam gong. Being severely hard of hearing is not the first quality you may pair with a music know-it-all, but for Ian Capon, his musical experience and knowledge have won him the Empowerment Award from Oxfam. Ian, who is also partially blind, has been volunteering in Oxfam's book and record shop for just over a year. Ian, who previously worked as a sound technician and on radio, was selected because of his contribution to the shop's music team. He uses his experience to evaluate often rare and sought-after vinyl records so the shop can get the highest possible price for them. A 1950s Chuck Berry single went for £80, while Odyssey and Oracle from the 60s band The Zombies brought in more than £400 for the store. Ian said, It's a huge surprise and a very nice award to get. I'm proud of the work Oxfam do in third world countries and proud of the difference we can make here. We're a very generous island that supports a lot of charities and I'm very grateful for all the donations we receive. Shop manager Rowan Bayliss said, I nominated Ian because he's truly amazing. It's humbling to see someone who faces such difficulties help people he considers worse off than him. Leader of the shop's music team, Rod Jones, said Ian was an extremely valuable addition to a great team. He really does know his stuff. He's better at the modern era and I'm better 50s to 80s, so we cover most genres between us. Ian's work has made more than £2,000 for Oxfam during his year of volunteering. Ireland's red squirrels buck national trend. A marked decline in red squirrel numbers now puts it at high risk of extinction, a study has found. But an Ireland expert believes ours are bucking the trend. Red squirrels, which are found on the Isle of Wight, but in few other areas of the UK, are among the species which face severe threats to their survival. The first major review of British mammals for more than 20 years has revealed. Helen Butler of the White Squirrel Project said she was surprised by the findings. We are, we are doing our own big survey of corridors, woods and gardens and we've got so much data to show that they are thriving over here. We have had so many babies reported lately. We have always estimated 3,500 red squirrels on the island, but this figure was based on woodland, and now they are using gardens and towns, so we estimate the actual figure will be much higher. A lot of the success is thanks to people feeding the squirrels in their gardens. People should use sunflower seeds, corn on the cob, pine nuts and fruit, and leave it in a safe place that can't be reached by larger animals. The study, led by the Mammal Society and commissioned by government agency Natural England, examined 1.5 million records of mammals across Britain, including data from citizen science reports and local wildlife groups. It found at least one in five British mammals is at high risk of extinction in the face of threats such as disease and loss of their natural habitat. Also at high risk are wild cats and grey long-eared bats. Populations of nine species including hedgehogs, water voles, hazel dormice and even rabbits have declined in the last 20 years. The study of 58 native, naturalised, introduced and reintroduced species showed. Hedgehog numbers have fallen by two-thirds since the previous estimate in 1995 and water vole populations are thought to be just a tenth of what they were in the 1990s. 
pensioners to make up a third of the Isle of Wight. If the island was a country, it would be the most aged in the world, even above Japan. Pensioners are expected to make up almost a third of the Isle of Wight's residents by two, uh, sorry, 2026, according to the latest population projections. The Office for National Statistics, ONS, estimates over 10 years the proportion of senior citizens will increase from 27% in 2016 to 31%. Improvements in healthcare and technology mean people are living longer. However, this puts greater pressure on the NHS and social care. Head of Charitable Services at Age UK, Nick Atfield, said the Isle of Wight mirrored a national trend but was slightly ahead of the curve. She said, we are finding although people are living for longer, they are living in poor health for longer. Age UK Isle of Wight focus on early intervention to allow elderly people to stay independent for longer. They have worked with Southern Vectis to make the buses more age-friendly. Miss Atfield said, We sometimes see people and think we could have changed their situation had we only seen them six months earlier. Elderly people can be a huge asset to the island. Even the Isle of Wight Festival is 50 this year. Everyone is getting older and we need to embrace it. The Isle of Wight Clinical Commissioning Group, CCG, is responsible for commissioning services for the island's NHS Trust. A spokesman on behalf of both organisations said they recognised the long-term challenges an ageing population would bring to the island. They said, plans are already taking shape with many aspects already having been implemented and with more to follow over the next three to five years. They include working more closely together as organisations to help prevent those who are particularly vulnerable, like the frail elderly, from reaching a crisis point. The figures form part of ONS population estimates, which are calculated every two years. Statisticians study birth and death rates and look at how the pop area's population is ageing. ONS estimates the island's population will increase from 140,000 in 2016 to 145,000 by 2026, a rise of 3.8%. Putting new flagship through her paces. White Link's new flagship, Victoria of White, has impressed senior managers, captains, and engineers during her first sea trials in the Sea of Marmara. The ship has completed three days sailing with the staff from the Semery shipyard in Yalova, Turkey, a Lloyd's register surveyor, specialist engineers, and White Link representatives on board. They have been testing all essential systems, including the state-of-the-art hybrid power drive. Those on board have also been, been completing full-speed trials, manoeuvring and turns. Captains Tom Vincent and Mike Smith and Chief Engineer Andy Hutchison were on board the ship for the sea trials. Captain Vincent said, Mike and I have both handled the ship, getting the chance to try essential manoeuvres. She handles extremely well with the hybrid system and four Voith Schneider propellers providing ample power. White Link will take delivery of her at the end of June. And it's goodbye from Chris. And Brian. And this is Pauline. And this is Barry reading the first letter, which is from Martin Cave of Brooklyn. <coughs> As we leave the EU, concerns about various aspects of animal welfare are being raised. So it was interesting to see the letter last week from Mrs M Matthews about the cruelty involved in the long-distance transport of live animals. 
My concerns revolve around the issue of the Islamic religious slaughter of animals without priest stunning. Halal. Parliament will, will not yet ban this inhumane practice, but wholesalers and retailers should clearly mark halal pr- pr- products, so this is not always the case. A few months ago, I bought a packet of jelly sweets for my grandchildren, and I noticed that one of the ingredients listed was beef gelatine, brackets, halal, in tiny print, but at least marked as such. I have since purchased jelly sweets from shops across the island and written to the producers and importers. From the replies I have received, it seems that approximately 50% of beef gelatine in jelly sweets is halal. The irony is that many children buying these sweets must come from the island farming communities, and if their families slaughtered their animals without pre-stunning, they would be subject to bans and fines, etc. So until Parliament bans halal, jelly sweets marked with the red tractor animal welfare assurance mark or containing pork gelatine seem the best way of avoiding it. Reason for RNLI suspensions. This is a response from John Keyworth, Lifeboat Operations Manager, Benbridge RNLI, and John Gulliver, Chairman, Benbridge RNLI Guild. In view of Mr Bristow's two letters, County Press 4th of May and 1st of June, we feel we owe our many supporters in Benbridge and on the Isle of Wight a response. As with most issues, there are always two sides of the story. As far as removing the collection box from Mr Bristow's shop, our volunteer went in and asked the lady who was serving, Mr Bristow was not there, whether, given Mr Bristow's earlier letter in the county press, they would like the box removed temporarily. She said she thought that might be sensible, so it was duly taken away. We would be more than happy to bring it back to Mr Bristow if he would like us to. We're truly grateful to all our supporters who allow us to put collection boxes on their counters and to all those good people who put money in them. The recent bad publicity about incidents at Scarborough and Whitby is clearly regrettable, but in both cases what appeared in the press was very one-sided and bore little resemblance to the truth and the decision to stand down volunteers was certainly not taken lightly. The RNLI recognised the years of dedication and the skill involved in becoming a crew member, Halm or Coxon, and fully understands and respects the close bond and camaraderie of the crew and other volunteers, but there are some behaviours well, that that will not be tolerated. Lifeboats cannot be allowed to be taken for joy rides in rough weather without full crew, nor does hardcore graphic pornography have any place at a lifeboat station. Bullying or aggression, aggressive behaviour and threats of violence towards volunteers or staff will not be tolerated. The RNLI press release of May the 12th makes interesting reading and can be found on rnli.org.uk news and media, and then search for Daily Mail. Finally, the reserves Mr Bristow quotes are exactly that and provide the RNLI, in line with the Charity Commission's guidelines, with enough funds to operate for 6 to 12 months (coughs) without income. It costs £180 million a year to run the service, nearly half a million pounds a day, plus a capital expenditure of £40 million to £50 million a year in replacing old lifeboats and infrastructure. So £200 million would not last long. Here we have a letter from Anthony Cotton, SSAFA Ambassador and Coronation Street Actor. As an ambassador for SSAFA, the Armed Forces Charity, I would like to bring to readers' attention some recent research that the charity has carried out which looks at loneliness and isolation experienced by working-age veterans on the Isle of Wight. Many of my closest friends are from the forces community, both currently serving and veterans. The research shows an alarming rate of isolation and despondency among younger veterans. More than a third reported they felt overwhelmed by negative feelings since leaving the armed forces, and just over a quarter had experienced suicidal thoughts. Reasons for this isolation include losing touch with friends and colleagues in the forces, physical or mental health issues, and struggling to relate to people in civilian life. In fact, a third of the veterans agreed it was difficult to open up to people from a non-military background, and almost a quarter admitted to struggling to fit into civilian life. I encourage any local veterans who are struggling to come forward and get help from SSAFA 
please visit ssafa.org.uk slash fight. It has been providing lifelong support to our forces and their families since 1885. Apple tree sprouts oak leaves from Arthur Reader of Newport. I don't know if this is particularly rare, but we have an oak tree growing out of one of our apple trees. The tree looked dead when we moved it here, so we cut it down to a stump. Since then, it has thrived and has even produced fruit. A few years back, we noticed another branch growing out from the truncated remains, and when leaves sprouted, they were oak. I presume a red squirrel or a jay had stashed an acorn in there that has germinated. Anyhow, I thought this might be of interest to readers. Now we have a looking back. A hundred years ago, June the 15th, 1918, two top military men joined the Sunday sermons in Ryde in connection with the Church Army Hut Week. Colonel Craddock from Devon presided at the service and was supported by the Admiral, the Right Honourable Viscount Jellicoe. The Reverend gave a speech and said it was wonderful how the Hut movement had tended to keep their boys at the front fit, mentally physically and morally. So the island mourned the loss of Braden's revered ex-schoolmaster, Samuel Bailey, has been headmaster of the school in Braden for 45 years. It is thought 3,000 island children would have passed under his tutelage and benefited from his musical and sporting ability. 75 years ago, that's June the 12th, 1943, All Saints Church, Gurnard, celebrated its 50th birthday with a cream tea the vicar said his memory of the church went back 30 years. More than 70 people attended. Wings for Victory Week, cows proclaimed a target of £100,000. It was hoped the programme of social events would present the Chancellor of the Exchequer with a substantial free gift, enough for five mosquito bombers. Savings groups were set up in friendly competition and the most successful group received the Thor Burn Cup during Warship Week. And 50 years ago... June 18, 1968, parents from across the island complained to the county press about conditions in primary schools, with crowded classrooms, inadequate buildings and substandard toilets. It was thought the post-war progress in education had stagnated, and primary schools had particularly felt the chill. Also a scrap of paper in an ancient tin trunk found in the rubble of a bomb-devastated house at Frankfurt, <coughs> Germany, provided an incredible link between a Swiss doctor who visited Ride and a resident of Seaview. The paper had a drawing of Ride by a Mrs Christie of Seaview, which was sent home by the visiting doctor as a souvenir. It is thought the drawing had been passed down to the doctor's son and then lost. When it was found, it was brought to the island by another visitor, who happened to know Mr Christie. 25 years ago, June the 11th, 1993, Marks and Spencer <coughs> ended more than a quarter of a century of speculation when it announced it was to open a store in Newport. m and announced it had submitted plans for a 40,000 square foot store on the former Juicen site. Shanklin seafront businesses were up in arms as Southern Water started exploratory wor work on the Esplanade just as the vital holiday season started. They claimed the work was noisy and would drive tourists and trade out of their town. And ten years ago, <coughs> June the 13th, 2008, environmental bosses predicted the landfall site at Standon Heath would be full by 2015. The waste report said sh shipping rubbish off the island was not viable and the council was considering options for future waste management. Also, a drugs investigation by Isle of Wight police, codenamed Operation Augustus, resulted in three men being jailed at the Isle of Wight Crown Court. Detectives from Newport CID, officers from the Roads Policing Unit, officers uh, plus the Island's Intelligence Unit and the Dog Support Unit all contributed to a find of £4,500 worth of heroin. Now we go to White Memories. Ride folk have a head for history. Historic Ride Society has been on quite a journey since it opened its Heritage Centre in 2011. An impressive 29,329 volunteer hours have been put into the centre since then, not to mention the countless hours put in before the doors were opened. 
During Volunteers Week, a national celebration that took place at the beginning of this month, Historic Ride Society paid thanks to all its volunteers and renewed its appeal for more volunteers to join them. The Ride District Heritage Centre at Royal Victoria Arcade Union Street is a hub for the history of the town. Currently, there are displays on a range of subjects, including, including the Royal British Legion in Ride, the hovercraft and other forms of local transport, the early history of Ride, schools and shops in the area, the Donald McGill Postcard Museum and more than 8,000 photographs on a big screen. There are also videos and oral histories of local residents recalling their memories. The Society all put, also puts on monthly quizzes and talks and Ride Town Council considers the centre a valued asset. Gillian Druitt, trustee of Historic Ride Society, described the centre as a central point of remembrance for the community and a memory depository where everyone can come and dip in and out. Gillian added, everyone that comes in is amazed that there is so much to see. By having the resources we do, we have had the BBC come to us for information and filming. When Whitelink was raising the discussion about how to revitalise the pier, it came to us. We hold an amazing amount of information, a real treasure trove. Since the early days, more rooms have been renovated and opened up in order to display more of the Society's vast collection. At the end of May, the Society had welcomed a total of 20,142 visitors to the museum. All of this is down to the hard work of volunteers. There are no paid employees at that society. Historic Ride Society wants to go even further and develop the museum with the new equipment and expand the displays. But for this they need more volunteers, particularly to help with fundraising. And Gillian said, our volunteers are amazing. They are a small band who work extremely hard. If there were no volunteers, there would be no Historic Ride Society. This is something our chair mentions a lot at our meetings. And it is so true. Due to the lack of volunteers at times, we've had to close. If we are shut, we then lose revenue. We cannot afford to lose revenue. We need to stay open. We need to get visitors through the door. And we need to raise funds. And to do any, any of this, we need volunteers. We are a friendly, welcoming bunch. And if you have an interest in history or have stories to tell to our visitors, please come and pay us a visit for a chat to hear more about our plans. Our volunteers do everything for the society. We have those that meet and greet, those that use their handy person skills to mend, paint, fix things. We have ch those that l log the exhibits, those that can add to the visitor experience by really engaging with those coming through the door. We also have those that do research. We have people who want to know what their houses used to look like in the past, and builders and architects who want to do building research. We have volunteers that go out into the community to other groups to give talks, presentations, and we have other volunteers that help when we, we have other groups to come and visit our resource. We have some volunteers that help fundraising. Fundraising is something we really need to focus on a lot more. We would like someone who could help to raise our profile for us on the internet. We have things that could be sold in an online marketplace, but we don't currently have those skills. Like most places, it costs quite a lot to open and operate the centre in the Royal Arcade. We took a hit, hit in visitor numbers last year and had to dip the into financial resources. Gillian added, I have been involved as a volunteer from very early days and I do feel very passionate about the place. I started as a volunteer and was then a member on the committee. Now I am a trustee. There is room for progression if volunteers want to rise to the challenge. I am the only woman on the committee, and I would welcome another female voice. I moved here in 2008, and when I arrived I knew I would have to join something, somewhere, to meet people and make new friends. I hit lucky as I joined the society from the beginning, and I am now one of a very small group who have been serving the local community from the start. I have learnt a great deal about my new home and made lots of new friends. Anyone wishing to volunteer is encouraged to go and meet with those already at the centre to get a feel for the place and its atmosphere and to talk about how they could help. Now we move on to my view 
and we start with an article by Matthew Chatfield. Are we all miserable, whining tightwads? It was back in 2014 that island-based company Liter Literators threw in the towel, briefly making national headlines when it blamed the closure of its operations squarely on us, the island's residents, and memorably branded islanders as miserable, whining tightwads. Were we shocked? Outraged? Hardly. I think the worst we could muster was a bit of wry embarrassment. Maybe we started at our shoes and shuffled uneasily because in our hearts we knew that it was true. And it's an uncomfortable truth. Sure, we can be polite and welcoming if we want to, who can't? But when it comes to a stopping people having fun, we have something on this island that brings out snivelling, entitled, self-important complainants in a way that mainlanders can only wonder at. Let me bring to your attention the remarkable letter in this paper from Mr S Cooper of Braiding, County Press, 25th of May, in which he criticises the Sandown community event Hullabaloo as a total joke and waste of money and people's time. He details the lack of disabled toilets, disabled parking and proper food. He lamented further that there was no entertainment. None! It would be easy to pick apart these complaints and others have done so elsewhere. So let's take the broader picture. Mr Cooper must have had some purpose in mind when writing to the paper. So what could it have been? Clearly, Hullabaloo wasn't to his liking, and I have some sympathy with that. After all, there are quite a few events going on across the island that I wouldn't enjoy. I avoided going to the unicorn weekend at Tapnell Farm last week, for example. Why? Because as a man in my fifties, I was sure I'd, I'd not be a part of the targeted demographic. Can you imagine me prancing about with a sparkly unicorn on my head? Actually, don't try. The key thing here is that despite my conviction that the unicorn weekend is not for me, I am more than happy for others to wave their rainbow horns and pay to do so if they see fit. Tolerance of other people get, getting on with their lives in their own time is what is needed and to avoid painful accusations of whining. So what about tight watery? Mr Cooper's disappointment at the waste of money must have been uttered through clenched teeth, as even he couldn't really find a way in which any of his own money could be spent on this free event. Halibaloo was just a load of people spending their own money or, mo or money that they'd got as a grant. So again, let them. It's the miserableness that really hurts, though. No, no entertainment. Friends, I was at that event, and let me tell you, I saw a pirate ship, a steampunk tractor, a giant turd on wheels, pursued by a fly cycle, piloted by one of the country's leading entomologists, for free. And if that's not entertainment, I don't know what is. And now an article by Jake Harrison. Should all cyclists have insurance? The sun has got his, got his hat well and truly on and the summer season is finally upon us. This means most of us will be using the roads to vacate to the nearest beach in search of sand, sea and sunburn. So whatever transport methods you decide to take, remember the roads are for everybody. The summer has arrived, so that of course means our long and winding roads are going to be clogged up by angry drivers, arguing couples, ungrateful screaming children and cyclists. Now the latter interests me. What is it about these spandex-clad clusters, often perceived as lycra louts, that fly around the island on a daily basis like some sort of Braddy Wiggins on, of the white? This is not the Tour de France we're talking about here, rather the Tour de Freshwater. Some look very professional. However, others look as awkward and as wibbly-wobbly as Boris Johnson on one of his Boris bikes, or an elephant painfully trying to ride a unicycle. I realise there will be many people who will presume I have a hatred for cycling and cyclists. This is not the case. Let me tell you, I have owned a bike before and I understand the enjoyment of throwing on your shorts and taking in some of the wonderful scenery the island has to offer, especially during the hot summer season. Though I wouldn't ever dare call myself a proper cyclist. And anyway, I now have a far more relaxed approach to the summer season. I subscribe to the three B's for my idea of summer heaven. Beach, beer, dot, 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 and more beer. There are many pros to cycling. It's cheaper for a start, far more beneficial for your health, and a sociable way to spend a Sunday afternoon. 
Learning to ride a bike is a monumental mo moment for children, too. Although I must shamefully confess, I suffered the humiliation of using stabilisers until the age of seven. Cycling is also a step towards helping protect the environment. However, I do believe cyclists should take extra care and responsibility when using the road for their own safety and the safety of other road users. I recently read letters in the county press regarding the Randonne, where more than 2,000 cyclists took to the road. This, as you would imagine, caused many delays and some of the cyclists that took part were said to have been very rude, taking up most of the road and behaving quite dangerously. I often see cyclists ripping up, zipping up at one-way street in the wrong direction or weaving their way in moving traffic, between moving traffic. Some cyclists think they own the road. Trust me, they don't. Nobody does. Perhaps proper training is required and such, such as a cycling theory test. This would incre increase cyclists' road knowledge and make them safer to other road users and obviously themselves. Cyclists are involved in countless accidents every year. So what about compulsory road insurance for every bicycle believer? Of course, they're not all as bad. Many are aware of the dangers of motor other motorists, motorcyclists and even horses. Island roads are dangerous enough already. And it also doesn't help cyclists that we on the island are home to many awful drivers who put cyclists in grave danger on a daily basis with their aggressive and impatient attitude. The roads are for everybody. Now, now, children, let's all play nicely. We move on to uh, the behind the news, a day to remember their service. On a grey windy day in March 1987, helicopter pilot Tony Gear was flying towards one of the most harrowing disasters to scar the 1980s. The Herald of Free Enterprise, a railroad passenger ferry, had turned on its side as it was leaving the Belgian port of Zeebrugge the previous evening after its bow doors had been left open, allowing tonnes of seawater to flood inside. The giant ferry, ferry became unstable and rolled onto its side, killing hundreds of passengers who had become trapped. All through the night, teams of rescuers had pulled desperate people, many of them service families, from inside the wreck of the doomed ship. However, by the time Tony's crew arrived at the scene, all they could do was recover bodies. It was not the only time Tony was caught up in a 1980s disaster. Just 18 months later, in December 1988, his crew was dispatched to recover passengers from the Pam Am Flight 103, which was blown up by terrorists over the small Scottish town of Lockerbie, killing everyone on board, as well as taking the lives of villagers. Tony and other helicopter crews undertook the grim task of locating and recovering the bodies of the passengers and crew from the flight, who were spread for miles across the countryside. Much of his work he still declines to talk about, such as his role in Northern Ireland during and after the Troubles and the sights he saw during the traumatic recovery missions. Speaking about Ireland, he said, You are marking yourself out. You don't want to do that, even now. The Ireland's Armed Forces Day parades take place tomorrow, Saturday, in Sandown. Nationally, <coughs> the event takes place on June the 30th. The commemorations will be attended by the Lord Lieutenant of the Isle of Wight, Major General Martin White, as well as the band from his former regiment, the Royal Logistics Corps, and will involve veterans and current service personnel, as well as cadets. Terry Clarkson, the County Parade Marshal for the Islands R RBL, said, It is a national celebration of the con contribution members of the armed forces have made to the security of this country and around the world. Obviously, they also work in disaster areas, as seen last year in hurricane and storm relief. It is about recognising the sacrifices and contribution men and women, both past and present, have made. One of the younger veterans supporting the parade is Tony, now 63, of Churchill Road, Cows. He is happy to discuss his record of service with the RAF, which began in 1975 and encompassed a stint working for the United States Coast Guard and postings to the Falkland Islands following the conflict in the early 1980s. He joined the RAF in 1975 as an airframes mechanic and became a helicopter crewman in 1979, 
before becoming a sergeant in the 1982 flying helicopters. He left the service in 2008 with the rank of flight lieutenant after rescuing more than 3,000 people and recovering around 1,000 bodies. He currently works with air cadets on the island and is also involved with the SSAFA, the Armed Forces Charity. He said, what was horrible about Lockerbie was I was second crew. We got called and arrived there without really knowing what would happen. The destruction you could see the next day was absolutely horrendous. He spent a period on secondment to the US Coast Guard and was also involved in rescuing people in New Orleans caught up in the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. He recalled the terrible destruction and the widespread flooding which occurred when levees holding back seawater from the New Orleans were breached. He said we were pulling people from the rooftops of buildings. Another former policeman, who is supporting Armed Forces Day, is 45-year-old Mark Lawson, a former pupil of the then Medina High School. He joined the Royal Navy at 16 when he left school. He said, There was a lack of employment prospects on the Isle of Wight. I had a choice between doing catering on the island, but I used to be in the Marine Cadets in Ventnor when I was really young, and that gave me the frame of mind for the forces. He trained as a radio operator in the Navy and served on board a number of vessels, including HMS Minerva. He said we were on a war footing, but were not really used. He also served on board HMS Norton, the last wooden-hulled ship in the fleet, and was involved in operations in Northern Ireland. He also served in the Mediterranean and off the Falkland Islands, eventually rising to the rank of Chief Petty Officer. He said, I enjoyed it. You worked hard and you played hard. I definitely learnt discipline and good way of life. He also told how much he valued the support of his wife during his service career and expressed his gratitude to her for looking after the children when he was away for long periods of time. He left the Navy in 2015 after training as a first responder, a career he currently, currently enjoys today. Two parades are taking place in Sandown tomorrow the first takes place at 10.30am and the second at 12.30pm. Uh, now we're going to have a look and see what's on on the island. OK, so do you need help getting online, accessing the internet, setting up an email address or job searching? Carol's Library has a digital support assistant who can offer free one-to-one -one sessions on Fridays between 10am noon. Sessions must be booked in advance. The library also has a family historian offering one-to-one -one sessions in helping <coughs> with family history. Sessions are held on Monday mornings at an hourly rate of £6 and must be booked in advance. Bookings for either can be made by contacting Cowes Library on 293341. Cowes Library, again, has an experienced volunteer who is providing a series of three weekly two-hour lessons on Tuesdays from 2pm to 4pm to help you get the most out of your iPad. The sessions are free, but you need to register your interest by contacting Cowles Library on 293341 and also have your own iPad. And in the West White, we have two events. We have the Alzheimer's Cafe, which meets at the Holy Family Centre Totland on Wednesday between 2pm and 4.30pm with a presentation by Maggie Bennett. What happens to memory and attention, followed by a buffet tea. For everyone with dementia, their families, carers and professionals. And new members are welcome. And the Magic of Great Music, presented by David Shirley, is at Freshwater Memorial Hall on Wednesday at 2.30pm. This week it is virtuoso concert bands from England, USA, Germany and the Czech Republic. Admission is £3 to cover hall costs and interval refreshments. And all, all is set for the village fete at um, Carisbrook. Plans are now underway, Carisbrook Village Fete. There will be live music from the Castle Jazz Band in the grounds of the Eight Bells from noon to 2pm. Next Saturday, June 23rd, as well as a bouncy castle, stalls, games, competition and a special raffle where the first prize is £100. The community event, which runs until 4pm, is organised by the Friends of Carisbrook Church. Bembridge Summer Festival, family fun for everyone. 
uh, Bembridge Summer Festival bounces back for a fifth year of family fun on Saturday, June the 30th. The action takes place in Steen Park from 2pm until 6pm. It's free to park and free to enter, but please consider making a donation on the gate as all funds will go to Bembridge Youth and Community Centre. To help celebrate five years of Bembridge Summer Festival, you can enjoy meeting special guests from the Isle of Wight Donkey Sanctuary and Happy Ponies, or watch a display from Haven Falconry. The annual dog show is always popular and offers your pooch the chance to walk off tail wagging with a cash prize of £100 for the best in show. Bring the children along to meet Captain America and Princess Belle and watch Jedi Knights battling a Sith Lord in the arena. They may need your help, to, so go along in your best Star Wars fun, fancy dress and there will be prizes for the best costumes. Ride Extreme Performers will be holding a circus skills workshop and there will be craft school stalls and an art exhibition to browse, bungee, trampolines, inflatables, music, lots of food and drink with a licensed bar and hopefully plenty of sunshine. Bembridge Summer Festival is sponsored by, by the Spinnaker Bembridge. And an information point drop out, dr- sorry, an information point drop in takes place for Citizens Advice Isle of Wight and Aspire Ride in Information Point at Dover Street Ride between 10 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. every Wednesday. During the drop in, adv- advisors will help you to decide the way forward. It's open to all. And choirs concert, New Church Male Voice Choir will be formed perform at Newport Methodist Church at 7.30pm on Wednesday. <coughs> the soloist will be Lucy Stevens. West End and TV stars have been announced for the first White at the Musicals Day as part of White Proms. Headlining the lineup at Northwood House's outdoor picnic concert on Saturday, August the 18th, is leading lady of musical theatre, Kerry Ellis, who was the first British El Faber in both the West End and Broadway productions of Wicked. Her many other leading role credits include Nancy in Oliver, Grisabella in Cats, Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady, Ellen in Miss Saigon and Fantine in Les Miserables. Kerry also originated the role of Meat in Queen's We Will Rock You and has released two albums, one with Queen guitarist Brian May. Also on the bill is Earl Carpenter, famed for his portrayal of Javet in Le Miserable and for playing the title role in Phantom of the Opera in the West End and in Broadway. He is also a former resident of Ride and looking forward to returning to the island. Actress Anna Chancellor will be the host of the evening. The last night of the Proms Day on Saturday, August the 19th, is headlined by Blake and will cater to lovers of classical music. Picnic hampers containing Isle of Wight produce are available to pre-order when purchasing tickets. Tickets are available on 213622. And at One Leisure, that's Medina Theatre, lots of different acts coming up. Um, Giovanni Pernice, the dancer in Strictly, he's coming in June, 27th of June at 7.30pm and it's called Born to Win. Story of the Beach Boys, that's a tribute on Friday the 29th of June at 8pm. Tickets are £18.50. The White Strollers presents Priscilla, Queen of the Desert and that runs from 6th of July to the 8th inclusive and starts at 730 And on the 7th of July there's an afternoon performance at 230 Tickets are £15 for anyone over 14. Dodo Street Band, Friday, 13th July at 7.30. Tickets £14, £5 for juniors. Rhythm Dance, or Rhythm of the Dance, Saturday the 21st and Sunday, 22nd of July at 7.30. Tickets are £23.50. And just going into August, the Little Mix Experience, Friday the 31st of August at 6pm. Tickets are £16. Um, if you want to know more about any of these events or other forthcoming events, you can phone 01983 823 And there's a reunion festival uh, on Saturday the 11th and Sunday the 12th of August. And it features some quite well-known acts, including Shalimar, Leo Sayer, Toya Tapar, Martin Kemp, Ches- Chesney Hawk and many others. And uh, the earlier you buy, the greater the saving. 
Tickets are available from over the counter at the County Press Shop, Newport, or Osborne's Menswear Ride. And now we're going to go back to reading a few articles from the um, first half of the County Press. Um, we start with, Thousands of islanders never use the internet. The world may be increasingly dependent on the internet, but thousands of islanders have not been online in the last three months and probably never have. Over the past 20 years, the web has become more and more a part of everyday life. However, data from the Office for National Statistics shows 7.1% of residents aged 16 or over have not used the internet in the past three months. That's 8,000 adults, and it is likely those people have never gone online, according to the ONS report. The average rate of non-use for the UK was 10%. Across the country, virtually all people aged 16 to 34 are recent internet users. Only 44% of adults age 75 and over, use the internet in the past three months. And uh, man's horrific birthday bike crash on Bali. Is my son dead or alive? This was the question a mother from Ride was asking after a horrific motorcycle crash in Bali, Indonesia. George Carter Wright, 20, of Partlands Avenue, was travelling with Alawite friends in Australia and had taken a trip over to the Southeast Asian island to celebrate his birthday. On his first night there, he was involved in a life-threatening accident when he came round a bend on his motorbike, slipped out on a thick layer of mud. The bike slammed into an open sewer ditch and George was catapulted across the road and smashed his chin into the concrete. George said, My first memory of the accident was waking up as I'm getting pushed through the hospital and my friend Alex was speaking on the phone to my mum to inform her about the accident. It was horrible, because all I could hear was my mum asking if I was dead or alive, but Alex couldn't get his words out to tell her. George suffered a broken jaw, a broken cheekbone, two broken wrists, a broken femur, gashes to his left heel, right knee and chin. He lost seven teeth and skin from the left side of his face and suffered brain swelling. After the crash, George was slipping in and out of consciousness. George said, after lying on the side of the road, losing a lot of blood, my friends and lo locals were doing their best to stop the bleeding from the multiple gashes to my face and body. When the first ambulance turned up, they took one look at me and then drove off. The second shortly followed and agreed to take me if we paid cash up front. The medics wouldn't touch up me, so my friend had to pick me up and put me in an ambulance themselves, bearing in mind I had multiple breaks all over my body. However, there was a 24-hour wait before the doctors would treat him. Because the hospital was waiting for confirmation from his insurance company, it would pay for the surgery. The 24 hours waiting in A&E with the injuries I had was the worst 24 hours of my life, said George. All they did was make me stable. They rarely came and spoke to me or asked me if I was OK, and every time I needed something, they would just look at me and carry on with what they were doing. Luckily, I had my friends George Parks and Alex Hill with me, who did such an amazing job at the hospital. Instead of enjoying his 20th birthday on the, the tropical island, George spent it undergoing seven hours of surgery. His jaw was plated with titanium and wiring running across his bottom teeth. He had a plate put on his left wrist and two bolts in his right knee. He spent three weeks in the hospital in Bali, and flew back to the United Kingdom on May the 28th, spending an additional three nights at St Mary's Hospital. He still has potentially three more operations to go for his jaw and wrist and will have to learn to walk again in six or seven weeks' time. Currently, he is having to use a wheelchair. His insurance covered the cost of operations, but at the time, surgeons were not able to put his teeth back because of the risk of infection. George is now fundraising to cover the cost of implants, physiotherapy sessions and specialist equipment to aid his recovery. An island boat building firm has won an export contract to build a new range of fixed firefighter saws. Aluminium Marine Consultants, based in East Cowes, has partnered with firefighting equipment supplier, supplier Anglico of Yorkshire and naval architect Walker Marine Design of Hamble to design and build a new generation of aluminium firefighting vessels. One of the fleet, a new 14-metre multi-role firefighting vessel, 
will be able to reach 33 knots, have a capacity to supply 4,500 litres of water per minute and carry a full set of firefighting and medical equipment. It is due to be ready by February 2019. Further orders will depend on the success of the first vessel but could include two catamarans and another smaller vessel. No value for the contract has been given. Rob Stewart, AMC's commercial director, said Ships these days carry chemicals and flammable materials, so we need to be able to combat that. These vessels will also help out harbours and fire fires, fight fires next to rivers and beaches. He added the vessel will draw upon the tradition of skilled and innovative craftsmen the island is deservedly world famous for. Thank you, everybody. I hope you found that interesting. And uh, I hope that you, this glorious weather continues and you can enjoy it over the weekend. It's good cheerio for now from Barry. And from Pauline. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. Tonight, the cancelled hospital appointments it's claimed are costing people their eyesight. And to click or not to click, some of your reactions to last week's report on echolocation. But first, ever since the 1970s, it's been accepted that visually impaired students should be entitled to government help to meet the added costs of higher education caused by their disability. The Disabled Students Allowance is intended to cover a range of things, including up to £5,500 for equipment and up to £22,000 a year for what's described as non-medical assistance. This could be someone to help you with aspects of work on your course or with sighted guiding. But back in 2014, the coalition government introduced some changes to the disabled student allowance aimed at spreading the cost and particularly getting universities to contribute more. The then universities minister, David Willits, told me why he was making these changes. Some of the examples of what the DSA was paying for at the moment in terms of you know, helping with note taking or programmes that involved a lot of diagrams, I did think actually were what universities that were disability aware under their Equalities Act duty should be doing to help disabled students anyway. And it's probably more efficient done that way. Well, perception is important. Mm. You know, visually impaired students might perceive that it's going to be harder to get funding and that they'll be put off applying. And that has a potential future impact on employment, which I know is what you want to do, get yeah. disabled people into work. But that, that would be terrible if that happened. But look, we're only expecting them, universities, to do what the equality duty provides for in other parts of life. So this shouldn't come as a surprise for someone who has any disability. They'll be very conscious of what it is that we expect people running transport systems to do or schools to do as against the extra help they need. We're applying the same approach to universities. David Willits. Well, at the time, fears were expressed that the change could lead to delays and confusion as disability assessors, the student loan company and universities thrashed it out over who should pay for what. And students are telling us that this is happening. Sam Hoskin is studying philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford University. In his email to us, he explained how he felt that Toing and froing between the Oxford Assessment Centre and the Student Loans Company, who approve his grant, had led to unacceptable delays. He was also concerned that less forceful students than himself might lose out. He began by explaining what he needed his disability student allowance for. A large part of my course is economics, which obviously involves a large amount of maths and diagrams and I needed those diagrams and that maths to be converted into Braille and tactile format. So roughly that, that would be 10 hours a week of support. Anyone that's had to spend time producing tactile diagrams uh, and, and lengthy equations in Braille will know it takes time. I was hoping for 250 hours or so, uh, and initially student finance gave me, gave me no hours at all. So how long did this battle go on for you to try to get what you thought you were entitled to? The initial uh, letter to student finance from my needs assessor with the recommendations uh, went off towards the end of June. The final 250 hours uh, was agreed basically in the middle of September, so just a couple of weeks uh, before I started my course. And how many times did you appeal? Because you obviously appealed against what was going on. 
Yeah, so the first funding they agreed, I then appealed. Uh, they then replied and said, OK, we'll, we'll give you the equipment and we'll give you 100 hours of support, which was still only sort of three or four hours a week uh, of support. So I then appealed again and they eventually agreed the 250 hours. Now, what's complicated about this, of course, is you've got uh, an assessment initially and then this goes to student finance. So you've got at least two elements involved. What do you think was the problem here? Well, I think there are two problems. I think the first problem is that student finance are working to budgets. They're working to caps. So they will try and give you the bare minimum they, they believe that you actually need to be able to complete the course. And I think the second issue was the university are responsible for some of my support. Uh, They tried to shift the responsibility of student finance onto uh, the responsibility of of my university. What was the feedback like in actually trying to get information while all this was going on? The main problem was that they were very slow to reply to anything. So um, I could sort of phone them and and ask them uh, what was going on. And they'd just say, oh, your, your application's pending. You know, we'll reply within... 15 working days or, or whatever they said. How concerned are you about what the way in which the needs of someone who's visually impaired are, are actually looked at? I think the predominant issue is that they're trying to save money. So they will say to you, oh, well, you're used to using this computer, which you know might be quite expensive, but they're normally expensive in the blind world because, well, they're, they're better. And they'll try and uh, persuade you to use a cheaper um, form of technology which might not actually be as good so they they seem more interested in cutting money than than what a, what a blind person actually needs oxford is you know a reasonably well-off establishment which can offer you additional help but yeah. w- what have been the experiences of, of friends of yours who've applied for the allowance from other universities uh, i have friends that are having problems that applied from less wealthy universities so a friend of mine a very little site like me he was let down by his uh, support from student finance and unlike me he wasn't able to rely on the university um, to pick up the slack because uh, his university simply didn't have the money to make up student finance's failings. So what is your own situation now? Have you got what you needed? Uh, I have eventually due to basically grit and constantly appealing to student finance but I think the problem is a lot of Blind people might not necessarily question it and they might just sort of take what they're given and, and, and struggle. Um, because I think you have a lot of faith in student finance. You know, they're a subset of the government. You presume that what they're doing is uh, it's going to be adequate. Paddy Turner is uh, chair of the National Association of Disability Practitioners, which represents university staff working directly with disabled students. Paddy, what's been the effect, do you think, of the changes to the disabled student allowance? Well, firstly, can I just say how articulate and accurate Sam's description of the whole process really was. The problem is, as Sam describes, you you effectively do still have a boundary, a boundary that is arguable over who is responsible. And that's where sometimes we get into the problems. So uh, there's a clear articulation from the assessor or the assessment centre as to what the student needs but it's interpreted uh, by student finance in a different way. And, um, and quite often uh, we do find that that interpretation is, as Sam describes, um, peculiar, in, in, to say the least, and, and, and contradictory between two elements of the same report. So just to clarify part of the detail here, who are the people who are assessing needs in, in cases like Sam's? Well, there is a whole range of needs assessment centres who are quality assured by an independent group called the DSA Quality Assurance Group or DSA QUAG and they register assessment centres and carry out audits of their quality on an annual basis and that is what the assessment centre needs to continue functioning. The people that carry out the assessments work within the assessment centre And so it's the responsibility of the assessment centre to make sure that those assessors are competent to do that job. But what I would say Mm -hmm. is that, you know, our advice to students would be, you know, to treat um, buying their needs assessment um, with the same kind of care that they might treat buying a computer. You know, have a real think about it check with the assessment centre who's likely to be assessing them and what the qualifications they have for that assessment. 
So what do you think needs to happen at this point to to try and get over these apparently very large differences in the way in which people's cases are handled? Well, I would uh, certainly recommend that we um, get into some more discussions about how the universities can be brought back in. It's it's, it's very... I, you know, it's very difficult for me to explain quite how complicated the interrelation between the market that they've designed, which means that, you know, there's rules around competitive marketing uh, of uh, businesses um, and the, the legal responsibilities. But either stop the process of providing the disabled students allowance direct to the student and fund the university so that the support can happen much more quickly. So, for example, one university or several universities have now effectively withdrawn from the DSA and said, any student who comes here, uh, you don't need to go to the disabled students' allowances because we will provide everything you need. And those students are getting their support turnaround in a matter of days as opposed to many, many months. And so the student doesn't how can have to they afford to do that if others can't? <laughs> well... Why are some universities more wealthy than others? And, uh, you know, you know that very well. We're talking about Oxford here. Um, but clearly there are many universities that have much greater pots of money than others. Mm. In that respect, there will be, um, you know, a, a postcode lottery effect, which is why I say instead perhaps, I mean, need very careful monitoring and working through, but instead of the student, the money going to direct to the student, mm. it's allocated to the university I'm going to ask you both this final question. Uh, Paddy, first, we're in June now. What mm. advice would you give to visually impaired students who are due to start their courses in the autumn? Get going as quickly as possible. Speak to the university. Make sure that they get hold of the assessment centre as soon as they can and ask appropriate questions of the assessment centre to ensure they're getting uh, the right kind of support from that centre with pe- from people who really know what they're talking about but but make sure that they inform the university and make sure the university is supporting them every step of the way. Sam Hoskin you've been through the whole process yourself what have you learnt and what would you pass on to students trying to do it this year? The main thing I've learnt is that only I know what I need only I have a true interest in securing the support I need and for those people out there currently applying going through the DSA process basically keep appealing keep fighting until you have every piece of equipment and every hour of support that you need. Student Sam Hoskin before that you heard Paddy Turner. Well we did invite the Department for Education to come on to the programme but they declined telling us it was a matter for the student loans company. They also didn't want to appear but have given us this statement. To help finalise Sam's support, our specialist team worked with his chosen independent needs assessment centre. There was confusion on the type and amount of non-medical helper support which Sam required, which needed further clarification. We apologise for the amount of time this took to resolve and any inconvenience this caused. We will be reviewing the circumstances of Sam's case to further understand why it took so long and where we can make improvements. We're pleased that Sam now has the necessary support in place and wish him every success in his studies. In other parts of the UK, the Students' Awards Agency administers the allowance in Scotland. In Northern Ireland, you'll find more information on the website Student Finance Northern Ireland. Well, we'd like to hear your experiences, good and bad, of applying for disabled student allowance. Details of how to contact us at the end of the programme. And thanks to those of you who did exactly that after last week's item on echolocation. That's the use of reflected sound to help blind people get around. We had this from Andrew Hubbard from Swansea. I was pleased to hear the change in attitude to clicking. I was a newly blind person in 1979 at Manor House Torquay. That's a rehab centre for newly blind people, now closed. Echolocation was more than discouraged. Clicking was punished with scorn and those doing it were told it was blind behaviour. Clicking was not acceptable in the sighted world. The message of rehabilitation was fit in. But Tim Pennick, in a long and thoughtful email to us, was concerned that we'd put too much emphasis on clicking the fingers and the tongue when describing echolocation. He thinks it's much more subtle than that. 
Many blind people, myself included, are constantly aware of an image generated by echolocation, but not perceived as such. In my case, it feels almost as though I can feel the object which is reflecting the sound. I've always thought of this experience as a sound shadow. It means that when I'm in a room, I know roughly what size the room is, how wide, how high, and how far I am from the nearest wall. If you believe that other blind people can do something that you fail to do, such as navigating a busy street using echolocation as your only obstacle detection option, then you're bound to be disappointed, which can lead to feelings of inadequacy. Well, we've now put Tim in touch with Dr Tala at Durham University, where the research is being done. She's offered him the chance to be involved in the next round of research. Finally today, it's claimed that up to 22 people a month could be losing their sight due to delayed and cancelled hospital appointments. The appointments are for conditions such as macular disease, glaucoma, diabetic eye disease. The findings are from a report by the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Eye Health and they're backed by a range of organisations, including the RNIB. Well, Helen Lee speaks for the RNIB on Health Matters. Essentially, Peter, I think it's that people with conditions like glaucoma, diabetic eye disease and wet uh, age-related macular degeneration need ongoing treatment and monitoring. And the numbers of people with conditions will continue to increase with our ageing population. So the demand on uh, eye care services has just increased massively and there hasn't been a comparable increase in services provided. So quite a lot of these people are people who need perhaps regular care, um, regular help with taking the, the drugs they need? Absolutely. So they need to be seen by specialists. The most important thing is that in many instances the treatment is time critical. Uh, For conditions like wet AMD, a matter of weeks will make a difference in terms of uh, potentially permanently losing sight. So that's why it's so critical that people get their appointments on time. Because you are putting it in very stark terms. I mean, is it really true that we know that you need to grab people's attention, but is it really true that a few weeks of delay can lead to people losing their sight? Yes, if people are having delayed or cancelled appointments and not getting the treatment that they need, their sight is deteriorating. That is the reality for people, shocking though it is. So what are you actually calling for, given that we know that the NHS is fighting on many fronts? The group has identified a series of 16 recommendations to uh, improve eye care capacity issues. We need the Secretary of State for health and social care to include eye health in the NHS mandate and then what what does that mean <laughs> so so essentially that's a, that's where it will be about prioritizing eye health so that rather than simply providing the services that have always been provided health commissioners will have to think about and plan their services to respond to the needs of their population in a much more coordinated and organized fashion and that's one of the key things we're calling for. Because it is sometimes suggested that although people say that losing their sight is one of the things they fear most, that actually eye care has a relatively low priority uh, in our health care. Is that true? I think it's absolutely true. In comparison to conditions like cancer, diabetes, heart disease and mental health, Eye care just isn't given the same priority and as a result we know that services are struggling. Helen Lee, the Department of Health and Social Care told us it expected the NHS to offer timely services without delay. It said the number of people able to access appointments has gone up by 10% over the past four years and that last year there were more than 7.5 million ophthalmology appointments. And that's it for today. If you want to talk to us about anything, including your experience of applying for the Disabled Student Allowance, you can call our Action Line for 24 hours after tonight's programme on 0800 044 044. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk or click on Contact Us on our website. And from there, you can also download tonight's and other editions of the programme. That's it from me, Peter White, producer Kevin Corr and the team. Goodbye.